It says going live, and now we are live. The Hangout is live on air. Hello, everybody who is watching, will be watching, and whatever. Um, yeah. Topic here is ISIS, false flags, prejudice, and Hitler. And before, I was going to just kind of stick it up as like a textual rant on my DeviantArt blog. Um, but then I'm thinking, you know, it might be cooler to just read my rant as an opening on this. And of course, I could still post it in the blog, but then I can also embed, you know, this video and, um, you know, go more in-depth in, into the topic and whatever. So, <clears throat> for right now, I'm going to read the opening. First, I would like to make clear that I am merely offering you data and my perspective on it. People may feel free to think, feel, believe, and express as they wish. I have no problem with that. Just be aware that anyone who might think they can force me to align with their views or goad me into a debate is in for a very large dose of disappointment. I'm a huge fan of discussion, conversation, sharing of perspectives. Whereas to me, debate is like a bunch of four-year-olds bickering over a toy truck. Oh, and I'm also here with uh, General Tate from DeviantArt as well. Uh, say hi or something. Hello. He's here with us. Anyway, um, for those willing to explore various perspectives and aren't much fans of debates either, I encourage you to neither believe nor disbelieve anything I say. As information is not your god and I am not your authority. Disbelief is just another form of belief. It is a belief in a lack there of something rather than the existence of something. So I would advise that people simply view information just as information in the same way you might observe a tree. It's not a good tree or bad tree, not a right or wrong tree. You don't have to agree or disagree with a tree. You don't have to believe in or disbelieve in a tree. A tree simply being a tree is an observable construct <clears throat> is fine. Feeling however you want to feel about that tree is also fine. You have the right to feel however you want about it, and it doesn't matter how many people agree with you or if you're the only one on earth that feels how you feel about that tree. In my opinion, it's nice to see that the powers who assume they be are starting to get incredibly frightened by the fact that the people are waking up. More and more people are realizing the truth about the golden rule. He or she who has the gold makes the rules. This makes null and void any spiritual, religious, or political constructs because he or she who makes the rules can also make themselves exempt from them. It's not a fair system. It does not have to be this way. It's up to the people, yeah, that's us, to change it. It is up to us to educate ourselves about how to change it. We need to go from the kindergarten mentality to a more mature mentality, and more and more people are in the process of doing exactly that. People are starting to understand that corporations control governments and dictatorships in equal measure through systems of bribery and blackmail. As this system becomes more transparent, we're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little tired today. <clears throat> we're seeing more scandals come out in the news. We are starting to wake up to the fact that ideology is all well and nice, but most, most of us do not walk our talk. We want everyone to do everything else for us, that adulthood has become a state of extended adolescence, that government as it has been run and at, the, and at the insistence of the masses to be run in this way has been nothing more than a dirty diaper that hasn't been changed in centuries, if not thousands of years. As Mark Twain once said, history never repeats, but it does rhyme. Seeing as those who have been running the scam over us for eons are getting really creeped out, they are starting to pull some very old cards and do some very old dirty tricks. 
They are taking our pulse. They want to see just how awakened we are or not, and what we are and are not still willing to fall for. These tactics, though many people are still falling for them, are becoming more obvious even to the mainstream news reporters. The reason they seem so shocked and surprised is because they are. These reporters have long since drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, so until now, the idea of organized crime running the show has been nothing more than conspiracy theory nonsense. Now that they are starting to see that it's actually real, well, sure, they're a little freaked out, a bit angry. So they're questioning and attacking the president's character. You see Republicans, Democrats, and everyone else being able to unite under, under one thing they agree on, that Obama is a corporate puppet. So because the Wall Street crooks are scared, they are starting to see if the same scam that worked on Germany will still work today on Americans and the world. So let's bring ISIS to the forefront of this rant. Before I explain how ISIS is a chess piece on the global stage in the previously described way, let's take a ride on the magic school bus back in time to the World War I and World War II era and break down some history. As Winston Churchill once said, those who understand the past control the future. Before World War I, the country known as Prussia was divided into two countries, Germany and Austria. Though there's a lot which can be said about the semantics of that, the simple watered-down version is that the banking cartels of the era viewed them as a threat. The banksters had never been fans of fair competition, after all. It was the banksters who inspired the game of Monopoly. It wouldn't even surprise me if it was also they who created the game in the first place, seeing as while we play it on a living room table, they play it for real out in the real world. So Germany was manipulated into World War I and made out to be the bad guys coming out of it. Truth be told that in both wards, all sides committed atrocities. That information is publicly available, and those who care to look into it surely can. I'm not looking to do too much sidetrack at the moment. I'm wanting to remain on point as best I can. <clears throat> Adolf Hitler was a classic Anakin Skywalker sort of character. Anakin was a Jedi. Hitler was a Christian. Anakin just wanted to keep the Republic and his loved ones safe. Hitler wanted to unite and restore Germany and Austria and bring them back into being an equal trade partner in the world economy. Anakin blamed the Sith for everything that was going wrong. Hitler blamed the banksters, and he assumed that banksters and Jews were the same one thing. Anakin was manipulated and co-opted by Senator Palpatine, a high-ranking member of the Republic elite, and eventually became the Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. Something going on over there, uh, Mr. Tate? Yeah, that's fine. Almost my other mic is being weird. Okay, may I continue? Yeah. Alright, cool. <clears throat> Hitler was manipulated and co-opted by the Thule Society, or some people call it the Thula Society, however you want to pronounce that, T-H-U-L-E Society, which was based in the ancient religion of the old Babylonian kings and queens and embraced ideas that one might label to be fascist, communist, socialist, and Marxist. Though there are differing views as to exactly what those four things truly are, I'm just making a more simple point. Senator Palpatine was the Sith Lord that the Jedi had been looking for and was playing the separatists, i.e. trade, banking, and other aspects of galactic unions and business relations, and the Republic against each other. The Thule Society, or Tula or whatever, was merely a front organization that the banking elites, whose religion is ancient Babylonian and not Jewish, Christian, Muslim, or any of the other popular religions of today, 
used to hide behind to create and manipulate various factions of, and people against each other. Palpatine groomed Anakin as a pawn and eventually corrupted him and turned him to the dark side, using the fear that if he does not, that his pregnant wife will die in childbirth. Hitler was corrupted and turned to the dark side out of the fear that if he did not, then he would be responsible for Germany's downfall. Atrocities committed by, An by Anakin, or excuse me, atrocities committed against Anakin and his loved ones were used as ideas to manipulate him into becoming the very thing he hated. Atrocities committed against German civilians by Poland and France were used as ideas to manipulate Hitler into becoming the very thing that he hated and controlled and puppeted by the very establishment he thought he was fighting against. The, the Sith use false flag attacks to trick the Jedi and the people of the Galactic Republic to endorse ideas that they would never have endorsed otherwise without being psychologically screwed with. Hitler used false flag attacks against his own people in order order to get them endorse ideas that they never would have endorsed otherwise without being psychologically screwed with. In the name of peace, freedom, and security for all, the Sith destroyed the Republic, created the Galactic Empire, which ended up collapsing under its own weight. In the name of peace, freedom, and security for all, Hitler destroyed the Germany he loved, created the Empire of the Third Reich, which ended up collapsing under its own weight. <clears throat> From 1776 to 1913, you might compare this time in history as being similar to Star Wars Episode I. From 1913 to 2001, you might compare this time in history as being similar to Star Wars Episode II. We are living Star Wars Episode III right now. The current situations, the newest being ISIS, the ISIS, not ISIS, there's no cyst, are equivalent to Palpatine getting on the comms and saying, Execute Order 66. As many Star Wars fans know already, Order 66 is an order in which a series of false flags are carried out and then blamed on the Jedi. Now, I'm not trying to claim that any group or religion are exclusive representatives of life. In fact, the Jedi and the Sith were two expressions of tyranny. Neither side considered themselves as being advocates of tyranny, and both sides thought that their way was the only right one. The Jedi practiced the idea of the enforcement of willing obedience through the threat of violence, whereas the, the Sith practiced the idea of the enforcement of unwilling obedience through fear and ignorance. The point I am making is that every group has its easily manipulated nutjobs and psychos, and these folks do not represent the majority of any group. However, these people are always made the poster children by the media, and the media acts as if they do represent the views of an entire group. Most Muslims are good regular people who just want to live their life in relative peace, the same as Christians, Jews, or anyone else. You will find radical psychos from each of these groups who are the extreme minority of the population of each of these groups. Radical psychos are very easily manipulated, just like dogs or any other dumb animals. They can be used as political pawns to herd the general public towards any particular agenda. They are counting on you to think that ISIS represents all Muslims and to convince the American people to hate Muslims. There is a large Muslim population in the United States, and the banking elites want us to do exactly what we did to the Americans who just so happen to have an ancestry that comes from Germany or Japan. They want us to harass them, to hurt them, to kill them, to throw them in FEMA camps, i.e. concentration camps. Currently, some of the American people are falling for it and drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid. However, there are many Americans who have an understanding that these banking elites do exist, and they understand that these sorts of mind game they understand these sorts of mind games and they are not falling for it. 
especially the younger people these days, who have the advantage of existing in an educational system that is so fucked up and tyrannical that it's difficult to not notice that the system is not your friend, that the system lies, that the system is run on false dichotomies. It's not a nice experience, but it has given the younger people an advantage as far as having the opportunity to wake up and not drink the proverbial societal Kool-Aid. The same thing is also happening in Middle Eastern con countries as well as in Israel. New paradigm versus old paradigm. The young against the old. Some of the older people are switching sides, but many are not. So it's a bit messy right now. When Jesus said, love your enemy, he did not mean go give a bangster a big hug. He did not mean don't defend yourself if you are attacked. He did not mean lay down and die. He means that if you allow yourself to be consumed by hate, that it is a cancer that can turn you into an Anakin Skywalker or an Adolf Hitler. Enough people are awake now that instead of humanity destroying itself, the hateful will destroy themselves. The rest of us just need to be smart, unite, and help each other and respect the rights of the hateful to commit their suicide if that's really what they want to do. It's better than the same old, same old. It's a big mess. We need to take responsibility. We need to clean things up and learn to respect each other and not bicker and war and destroy. So I want the people who are leaning more towards hate and prejudice to understand something. If you want to do that, then do that. I can't sit here being an advocate of freedom and boss you around at the exact same time. I would, however, like to give you a little bit of warning as to the consequences of your actions if you ultimately decide to fulfill road. Most of you who are filled with hate are ironically good people at heart. You do believe you are just doing the right thing. You've bought into the Orwellian lie without realizing you've done it. War is peace. Ignorance is strength. Slavery is freedom. That old line of dogma. So you cannot possibly, as of yet, realize that hating all Muslims for the action of a, 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 ter yeah, a terrorist radical minority or all Jews for the actions of a corrupt banking minority, etc., is the exact same thing as saying, Well, we call them damn niggers, they're dangerous, or the hell with all those white crackers, they're all Nazis, or females should be barefoot and pregnant, or all young people are stupid, or all old people are overqualified and incompetent, or all veterans and militiamen are dangerous psychos, or all Christians in the South are fundamentalist nut jobs who are going to give you some Jesus at the business end of a shotgun, or we got to get rid of all them chinks, or all those damn spicks are lazy illegal immigrants, you get the idea. You might not think that what you are saying is equal to all those examples. After all, this is the 21st century. We all know about what JFK said, what Gandhi said, what Martin Luther King said. We were raised to pride ourselves on being more civilized and not as primitive, archaic, and weak-minded as our predecessors. Most of us look at statements like, I want to go string me up a nigger and cringe in horror thinking we want to take that KKK hood of the racist son of a bitch and strangle the bastard with it. We are offended and appalled. We say, I could never act like that. Well, the hateful people among you think those same good things and have the same good intentions. The Nazis didn't think they were being hateful. The KKK didn't think it was being hateful. All these groups delude themselves into assuming that they are fighting evil on the side of good. And this is the road to becoming Hitler, becoming Darth Vader, becoming Stalin. Whatever example you want to use, be it historical or fictional. So, if you want to go down the, that dark path, destiny. No, I mean, <clears throat> then hey, go for it, but at least do it with eyes open. 
knowing exactly that this is what you're doing. No semantics excuses, no articulate sounding words of patriotism or smug justified arrogant indignation. Just face yourself, keep it real, and say to yourself that, yeah, guess you are a racist and you don't give a damn. Keep it real. Have that attitude if you feel you must, but keep it real. Don't pretend you're not a racist or that you're doing the Lord's work or that you just love your country. Just be honest that, yeah, you were hurt as a kid or your dog died or your wife left or whatever it is that's bugging you and you feel helpless and you need a beating pole to abuse and here's your opportunity to go hit a punching bag. Let's just tell it like it is. Be that way if you want to. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just saying do it with honesty, boldness, and pride. None of this hiding behind ideology crap. For those of you who want a better world, let's unite and not divide. Sure, let's be careful. Let's weed out these ISIS scumbags and give them a new hemp necktie or some nice healthy lead with their morning breakfast. Even Jesus lashed out at the banksters in the temple. I'm not saying we shouldn't get down to business here, but let's do it like compassionate, intelligent, critically thinking humans and not like rabid dogs. Let's unite with the good Muslims who are against ISIS just as much as any of the rest of us are. I believe that heaven and hell are states of being, not places. But for the good Muslims who believe in heaven and hell, I know that they believe that these extremist terrorists are sinning against creation and will burn for all eternity for it. They are just as honest about that as the wacko idiots are about thinking they're going to win 47 virgins and go out and blow, you know, if they go out and blow up a bunch of kids. So if you believe in the genuine honesty of the psychos, then consider believing in the genuine honesty of the good people too. Just something to consider. And I digress. Mr. Tate, are you still with us? Testing one, two, three. General Tate, dot to deviantart.com, aka Rich, um, whatever you want to refer to him as. Um, I know that he is currently kind of going back and forth between his computer and doing laundry, you know, and a few other things. So, um, you know, he's kind of here, kind of not at the same time. And I guess I just ran into a kind of not uh, sort of a moment. I'm receiving a Facebook message here. Do, 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 do. Um... Okay, um, Katerina just messaged me. I'm going to see if she wants to join us on the Hangout here. I just typed to her, I'm live on a Hangout, one in. So, for those of you watching either live or later on, bear with me for a moment. Mr. Tate is off in laundry land, and I'm seeing if um, I can bring Katarina in, who messaged me only a few minutes ago. I'm going to give her that link. Um, if there is anybody... Uh, watching this live, who is also on my Facebook, who would also like to participate in this hangout, send me a message. I'll give you the link. You can come join us, or join me at the moment. There is no us at the moment. He is um, currently, you know, off taking care of laundry or whatever. But, um... Until he returns to discuss, to continue discussing the topic at hand, um, I'm kind of offering 
anybody who wants to uh, hop in this conversation is welcome to. You probably already know that on Facebook, I am. Um, you know, I show up as Dave Kelso. If you go to facebook.com forward slash Time Warrior, T-I-M-E-W-A-R-R-I-O-R, -R -R -R, um, that's uh, my personal account on Facebook. So um, if I'm not already on your Facebook and you want to join this conversation and um, you want me to send you a link so that you can hook into this conversation, then uh, feel free to go ahead and hit me up and I will kind of give you that information. And in the meantime, I guess I will just kind of continue my perspectives on ISIS and all that. And also give you an example that um, I came across today and I uploaded to the Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy Facebook page. It's a video. The title is Non-Muslims Posing as Muslims and Being Violent. So it's kind of like the rabble-rouser factor. In France, many dark-skinned people who are racist against whites, who are not Muslim and do not even speak Arabic, are using Muslim religion as an excuse to commit acts of violence against whites. This is because those people are in crime gangs and are using the excuse of Muslim religion to cover their tracks and to keep blame away from gang or you know the blame away from the gangs. So true Muslims are being used as small guys and patsies for gang crimes. Getting this on the news in France has been difficult because it has become a social taboo to even suggest the idea that a non-white person could be racist against a white person. So the the same I, it's the same idea as claiming that you know saying anything bad about Obama makes you racist against black people or saying anything about the government of Israel makes you anti-Semitic. So please, folks, think before you act. We have a similar stupidity brewing here in the United States, so don't fall for it. Be smarter than that. And you know you can watch that that video on um, paradigm shift and educational comedy, um, the Facebook page there. And um, General Tate, how are you back? Hmm. Apparently not yet. Let's see if anybody else on Facebook wants to join me here. May as well post a status update then. I'm on a live. And I'll give. Looks like Jay Larson just popped on. Maybe he'll be joining us. Oh, yes, so bear with me, folks. It will be sooner rather than later before either Mr. Tate uh, pops back on or somebody else also joins us. Um, you can check out uh, his stuff on generaltate.deviantart.com. He does a lot of political artwork and stuff like that. Um, I've also got a DeviantArt account, for those of you who did not know that. And you can get to that through paradigm-shifting.deviantart.com. And, you know, you can check out all that insanity I've got uploaded there. I get pretty crazy with my stuff. So, yeah, right now we're just, like, at a nice little awkward moment where I'm thinking, okay, well, I'd like to discuss this topic rather than just rant on it. And Mr. Tate has disappeared for a second. I'm seeing if anybody else wants to come and join me. Uh, 
This is like where I'm halfway tempted to like play the freaking Jeopardy thing. <laughs> do 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 do. Well, my apologies to everybody for the delays here. Um, I know this Mr. Tate will be back sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, it's the sound of silence. Anybody else who wants to... Toss the invite link to a few people, see what happens. Again, my apologies to anybody watching for these delays. Can you hear me now? Welcome back, Mr. Tate. Mr. Tate, we've missed you. So, your take on all this crap. Are you still here? Okay, he was there for a second. <laughs> now we're hearing nothing. Well, we are having technical difficulties on Mr. Tate's end here, apparently. Please hold. The technical difficulties are being addressed. Your Google Hangout is very important to us. Please hold the line. You are number 3468 in queue to be answered. Mr. Tate, you were here and now you're not. Where the hell did you go, Warman? Well, that's interesting. It looked like he was trying to state that he was here, and then all of a sudden he's not here again. This is weird. I'm used to things like, you know, being like in the middle of intense group conversation and then there's like some really damn annoying like technical glitch that just like drops everybody and then we gotta like all pile back on and everyone's like, oh, what the fuck? Oh, that was interesting. I'm not used to this more like quiet sort of misalignment shit here. I guess it is more ease and flow and less chaos. Okay, anybody want to hop on with me and talk about ISIS and all this bullshit that's going on? Because I, I did a nice, big, long opening freaking rant, and it would be really good to get some other people's perspectives on it. And this is where Mr. Tate would have just kind of chimed in and, you know, started, you know, saying his piece on it. I know he has a lot to say on it. We've talked about it in, you know, private discussion. So he's not exactly lacking an opinion. But he's off, like, you know, um, trapped in the Matrix code or something. I don't know. Because it's like, he was gone, then he was here, saying he was here, then all of a sudden, like, gone again. 
So this is really weird. And usually I could pull other people from Facebook and do a Google Hangout with relative ease. But today everybody just seems really, 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 really quiet. Which is really fucking weird. One, two, three. You're back! I think maybe you are. I yeah, you were I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make this, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to get my headset to work and configure right, and it's being a bitch right now, and I listened to everything you said on the history of Anakin and all that stuff, that was so perfectly phrased. It, I mean, that, that, that was just, a, it's perfect synopsis, I can't, I can't it, there, there's nothing really left to well, I guess I could add more to it, more on the political front details, like. Well, yeah. I'm gonna sh I'm gonna conserve bandwidth and shut down my video here, and you can activate yours if you want, so that like, you know, all the ladies can swoon and whatever the hell else. But uh, <laughs> I'm gonna sit back and chill and let you rant. So go for it. <clears throat> okay. Great shit, brother. Because <laughs> I was gonna say. Let's see. Your video increase bandwidth setting. Okay, I don't know why. Okay, let's see. Come on, come on, camera. Is this working? So, yes, everything okay. is working. Right. So, school Good. us, USD four one one. Okay. Well, all I can add to that is I shared a video with you earlier, and um, your video is on one of your journals. I think it is. As I recall, you posted it. It was the video on France and CBN and all that stuff. Yeah, I. Er I'm stupid, right? Anyway, if you get if you get the chance to check that video out, I would suggest doing so. It's also available on Facebook. It's just about everywhere. It's being posted. You can hear and, me now. Yes. Okay, I was just having a momentary malfunction. I was just gonna say, yeah, I was talking about that video like about ten minutes ago. Okay, uh, I didn't. Oh, I, I didn't did catch that. that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I'm going to add to the point of, you know, we are living in very interesting and controversial times, and I personally go through, you know, moments of an internal struggle on the inside morally, you know. I mean, there's the side of me who is for peace, but is also locked in the paradigm of violence, war, degradation, suffering and destroying your enemy until there's nothing left is the only way to achieve that peace. And unfortunately that is too far from the truth and we've seen this multiple times. I mean look at World War One, you know, they bashed Germany into a informidable pit until there was nothing left of the German economy. And only a quarter of a century later we see a war that is ten times deadlier and has ten times as many casualties and creates weapons of mass destruction that have never been seen before, at least that we know about. And then only a few years after World War II, you have the giant military-industrial complex arms race, which is just a whole other dick-wagging contest between the East and West. And you have the space program, you know, which developed, came out of Nazi rocketry and was developed from, you know, the V-2s and the V-1 rockets that they used to bomb London. You have Soviet scientists that were taken out of Germany. You have American scientists that were taken out of Germany. They're trying to figure out how to outdo each other, outsmart each other, outwit each other. And it just creates this proverbial backwash loop of destruction and death. I mean, it's it's amazing to see all this technology at play, see how it works, see what it does, see how it can, you know, better humanity's life lives. We've seen it 
<clears throat> well, that was a bad warning. We've seen how the space program has benefited humanity on levels in the last 40 years that, you know, 100 years ago were unheard of, you know. Here I am sitting on this video chat and I'm talking to you. You know, that comes out of the space program. Things like that were unheard of back in, you know, 1900. Nobody ever thought, you know, 100 years from now that we would be sitting on, you know, the infancy of, you know, mass communication and, you know, much of what you see or saw in Star Trek back in the 1960s. But the only problem is, is we are locked in this loop of proverbial death and proverbial destruction, and we have yet to realize that the more we try to use proverbial death and proverbial destruction, all we get is more proverbial death and proverbial destruction. We don't get the peace in which we are looking for. And politicians, and it's not just politicians, I mean, you know, there's far more levels of intellectual backlash, if you will, that just go down into the streets of society, but I'm just going to go with politicians here for a minute. Try to, you know, consolidate power, if you will, like it's going to somehow, once once everything is all under, you know, the web of control, it's all of a sudden going to be better and everybody's going to benefit and the world's going to be in a better place because this regime controls it all. And in reality, all that creates is diffusion, distrust, anger, hatred, and a bunch of other bullshit that we've seen a million times throughout the history of empires. I mean, you go clear back to Rome and Constantinople, eventually there's some rival group that gains power and takes over that empire and then becomes as evil as the empire, the empire they just swore that they were fighting against in the name of freedom, in the name of the people, you know. Uh, look at Uganda, you know. Idi Amin, Dada, you know. He was the people's man. He was going to save his country from the white imperialists. Well, he became just as evil and wicked and whacked out as, you know, the people he swore he was protecting, you know, native Ugandans against. And it's just, it's it's gotten to a point of just, you know, we're starting to realize and awaken, thank God, to the reality that we are living in a world that just seems to be playing on this loop of tragedy and enlightenment. It's kind of like a Greek tragedy, you know. Um, it's a script, you know. A lot of people wonder, you know, how do you know this stuff? How do you know that humanity is this way or that way? And it's like, well, all you have to do is look at history. And as Dave made the point earlier, you know, if you know the past, as Winston Churchill said, you know the future. And in the words of Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I can't remember the exact quote. It's bad because I used to say it all the time, but <sighs> hold on. Speaking of the Internet, I will Google it. If I cannot remember, I shall Google it. Quote. I'll just quote David Icke and say, if you always do what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've always gotten. Exactly. <clears throat> and then there is the famous quote, I don't know if this is, I, or uh, Teddy Roosevelt. But the only thing that we learn from history, or about history, is that it just keeps on repeating itself. And that was a famous quote. I don't quite remember. It's not really a good day to ask me about famous quotes, I guess. But Maybe Einstein's definition of insanity will work better here. Because Einstein's definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again and always expecting different results. Quite. Exactly. Oh, I hit my, my, myself in the leg with a hammer. Ow, that hurts. Well, maybe if I hit my leg with the hammer on a different angle, then it won't hurt. Oh, that hurt. Well, maybe exactly. I'm 
come up from the bottom of the leg this time. Yeah, maybe that won't hurt. Oh, that hurt too. Okay, well, maybe if I hit myself with the hammer while I switch religion and pray to the almighty Easter Santa fairy and ala ala badumba da dinga da ding and throw salt over my shoulder and then hit my leg with the hammer, it won't hurt. Ah, well, that still hurts, but that's okay. That was just a punishment for my sins. After I repent, it won't hurt. Okay, I repented. Ah, it still hurts. Well, um, <laughs> it's that sort of stupidity. Exactly. Exactly. We, we, and fortunately, humanity is starting to realize that if we keep going down the same path that we've gone down before, it's just going to end up repeating the same path. We're essentially walking in this long circle, and we're starting to realize that we've been walking in a circle for centuries, and we haven't really been going anywhere. We've kind of made the cir circle an oval every once in a while, you know, like going to the moon and exploring the planets and looking at the universe and realizing how vast this creation is that we're living in. We kind of made it like an oval, but we're still in a circle, and we're, we're just kind of walking in this long, you know, going around and around and around, and people are starting to figure out that, hey, we're walking in a circle. We're not going in a straight line. We're not going forward but rather we're starting from the same point in which we keep swearing that we're going to get away from, but we've just got to keep doing exactly what we're doing to get away from that point, and they realize that that's not working. So now we've got to stop walking in a circle and realize that we need to walk in a straight line rather than walk in a circle, if that's a basic enough analogy. Or if we are going to walk in a circle... What type of a circle do you want? A rose garden or a minefield? Exactly. But anyway, I'm going to go on the topic of France and ISIS. ISIS is a definite chess piece, just like, you know, the entire Arabic world is being used as a chess piece. They know that the Arabs in particular are crazy and, you know, loopy and, you know, you give them you give them the fuel necessary, they will stir up a bonfire like you've never seen before. I mean, just watch all of the footage of the ISIS rebels and militants and, you know, the funding and the black ops agents they're giving them and the, the AK-47s and the RPDs and the RPGs and the RPKs and the tanks. Well, that's just the, the radical era. Like, I've, got, I've, got, I've got friends who are, who are Arabs that are, you know, peace-loving and... You know, they think that all these radicals are going to go I'm to not hell. Saying that, I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm just going off by what is written in the Quran and what is said in the Quran. And if you look in the history... It's written in the Bible. It's pretty destructive, too. <laughs> the, Bible's got very, the, the, the Bible's got very destructive points, yes. But it's all within a historical context. You know, it talks about famous battles and, you know, allegories to big events that might come or might, you know, come in some form. But it's not referring to, you know, stone, you know, stone homosexuals kill other people, you know, that don't think of you or, you know, worship the Quran. And, and, you know. In fact, the Bible did actually kind of say that. As a matter of fact, back in the biblical days, for something as simple as adultery... Um, it was stoning was required. You're talking, yeah, you're talking about the Torah, the basis of like, which well, the Bible came Jesus, out. Dude, that's why Jesus said, "He who is without sin casts the first stone," and everybody kind of looked at him like, "Oh." Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so, you know. That is why the, the Bible, religion. Everything that is in the Bible that you could find objectionable is all within historical context. It's all there as part of the grand, the grand scheme of the book. The Quran, the thing that's about the Quran is a lot of the earlier teachings that were moderate and like most religions, you know, like love your neighbor, you know, all of the, 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 the quote-unquote moral things that, you know, all human beings should do, you know, the good things, have all been predated by these later texts that Muhammad wrote. I have a and question. Have you ever read the Quran? Well, no, I haven't read the Quran. I know plenty of people I who have. have and they, 
But until you really read something, you only know what people are saying about it. You don't really know what's in there. I... Like, um... One thing I've heard about that's because you know how books get mistranslated and distorted by preachers and all sorts of stuff. Like supposedly the section about jihad was self-defensive. In other words, if your enemy attacks you, then you know it's like the equivalent of an eye for an eye. Attack them back only to that level, but then you know have mercy beyond that point. Don't go beyond what your enemy did to you. And that it doesn't say, oh yeah, well jihad is going and you know blowing yourself up and a bunch of kids and this and that, and then you're going to get 47 virgins. As a matter of fact, I can actually tell you where the whole 47 um, virgins thing came from. An ancient group known as the Ashashin, which the modern day pronunciation of that is Assassin or Assassin's Guild, <clears throat> they would do something really freaking dirty. What they would do is they would drug somebody and drag them off to this harem with all these women and everything. And while they're under these powerful drugs, they, they would make the person think that they're having like a, a near-death experience or something. And then they'd be told that, oh, you have to go and do this task and assassinate this person and, and kill yourself in the line of that and... And all these versions you see around you will be yours again. Because you're not on Earth right now. You are experiencing the afterlife. And all this will be yours again. And you can come back to this. So then they drop them back off on the street or whatever. And the person wakes up and they think they just had some mystical frickin' experience. And got instructions from God when really a bunch of fucking criminals came in and drugged his ass. And took him into a room and fucked with his head and then dropped him back out on the street again. So that's where the 47 virgins thing comes from. The Assassin's Guild or the Ashashin echoes way back. That has nothing directly to do with the Islam or anything. That's just a really ancient, dirty fucking trick. And it still works. I mean, now you don't got to drug people and throw them into a room. You just got to present yourself as an authority figure and go, yeah, this is what's going to happen. And if someone's freaking stupid enough to believe it, then they do, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of stupid people in this world. Mm -hmm. But as I was going to say about the original Quran, and this is not according to me or you or anybody else, this is according to actual historians who have analyzed the book in great detail and have been very careful on the translations, you know, from Arabic. The later verses in the Quran, you know, the ones that are all famous for violence and, you know, the famous verses that talk about, you know, beheading all those who do not believe and, you know, if if they don't accept the Quran, behead them, etc., so on and so forth. I don't know the exact verses because I haven't read the Quran. And I don't plan on reading the Quran anytime soon because, frankly, I don't have enough time at this point <laughs> to do so. I may eventually, and I should. But the later verses, and this is how they, the Quran is set up, the later verses predate... The, the later writings predate what was originally put in. So the later verses that are full of violence and full of wrongdoings come after all of the teachings that, you know, speak similar to what a lot of religious texts speak of, you know. So it would be almost as if like a thousand years from now they called the Old Testament the New and the, and the New Testament the Old and they flipped it around and didn't tell anybody they pulled a sneaky. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, yeah, because a lot of, a lot of the, the verses in the Torah come or from the Quran directly come out of the, the Torah and various other religious works. I mean, the Quran's almost kind of like a bastardized book. I mean, I don't mean that in the bad sense of, you know, it's a horrible book, you know, it's terrible, it's awful, you know, if that's what you believe in, that's fine, but... You mean it, you mean it like a, a dog that's a mutt, might have a little collie, a little poodle? Yeah, it's, it's, got, it's, got all these different, it's got all these different ideas in it. And the problem like is the United the Quran, States, a melting pot, a melting pot of different cultures, that sort of thing. Yeah, only... Right now, it's it's not presenting itself very well, unfortunately. And I feel sorry. And I know there are a lot of good Muslims out there. There are there, you know, Islam is probably is by far one of the most common religions on earth right now. 
next to Christianity and Judaism. And it's growing rapidly. And, you know, in the modern era, it's just, it, it's become more pervasive. I mean, all the religions have become more pervasive in some level. And, you know, there's a lot of good people out there with good intentions who don't mean to be violent or hateful or spiteful at any level. It's just, unfortunately, there are a lot of Arabs out there in the Middle East that, you know, are, unfortunately, they take those meanings in the Quran pretty literally. You know, they tend to stick with the later predated texts instead of sticking with what, you know, most religions tend to stick with, you know, which is peace and prosperity and, you know, do what is right and help those in need, et cetera, so on and so forth. And the globalists use that to their advantage. You know, they say, oh, look at those Muslims. They're no better than, you know, rabid dogs and no better than, you know, spiteful, hateful, ignorant human beings. You know, they, they must be punished for their inequities. They're arrogant. They're ignorant. They're stupid. They're this. They're that. They're this. They're that. And you have to stop and think for a minute. Wait a minute. They're doing the same thing to you as those Muslims, quote-unquote, are doing to themselves, saying that shit about you. So how is it beneficial for you to act the same exact way that the Muslims act and expect a different solution? There is no different solution there. That's like, Einstein's definition of that, the that, 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 Yes, that's like, that's like pouring gasoline on a bonfire and expecting to put the bonfire out because you're overwhelming the fire with more fuel and somehow that's going to put the fire out? Yeah, I have an analogy for that. I usually say, you know, people like to paint pieces of wood blue and write the word water on them and wonder why that's making the fire bigger instead of making it go out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Totally. I know in my experiences, um, and like for me, this is a lot of cognitive dissonance at first. It took me a while to like get enough over my ego and enough over myself to even be able to experiment with this to prove to myself that it works. But I, you know, I've seen time and time again at this point that, you know, when you come into contact with a hateful person and you respond to them compassionately, that that is one of the most efficient things you can do. I mean, point one, you have to mean it. You can't be faking it. Otherwise, you're still in the same energy as the other person is, only they're being more honest about it than you are, and then it falls apart. I mean, you've, you've really got to mean it from the bottom of your heart and be totally genuine about it. And when you can bring yourself to that, when that energy meets theirs, it paralyzes them because they don't know what to do with it. Because you become the flying pink elephant hovering down the street that isn't supposed to exist. You are defying their belief system. According to their belief system, you can't exist. You being you cannot exist. So when they experience that which they think cannot exist, it's kind of like that, you know, that unsolvable geometric shape puzzle that Picard wanted to unleash onto the Borg. <laughs> you know, you become kind of like that and it, it becomes an intellectual paradox inside their minds. So they're, they're shut down. I mean, it is, it's very easy to, to shut down, you know, trolls and things like that online, especially just by being nice to them. Because at first they think you're putting on an act like, oh, okay, all that niceness, that's bullshit. He's not really trying to respect me. He doesn't mean anything he's saying. He's just, he's just trying to fuck with me. Yeah, that's it. So then they figure if they put enough pressure on you that you're going to pop and, quote, unquote, show your true colors. But when your true colors are true from the get-go and it's not a tactic or a strategy but a genuine, valid expression of who you actually are, then they become like an 800-pound fat guy trying to run as fast as he can down the block. He's going to run out of energy and burn himself out. Well, you're just standing there looking at him like, okay, well, what was the point of that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And, it, you know, I've put that to work, and it, it does work, but 
the, and getting to that point can be a bitch because there's all this cognitive dissonance because you've been taught that your reality is that if you respond with compassion to people, they're just going to bend you over and make you their bitch. And so don't get punk. Don't be naive. Don't be stupid. Don't get used. That's all just wishful thinking bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And it is wishful thinking bullshit when you're using it disingenuously as a tactic. Then that's completely correct. It won't work. You're fucked. It's crap. When it's a disingenuous tactic. But when it really is a genuine expression of you being you, then it's solid like a rock. And getting yourself to that point where it can be that requires a lot of deprogramming of old paradigms. Because ego wants to be justified at first. Ego... Ego wants to be like, well, I know I should be compassionate and this and that, and I know how that's going to help me and what's gonna, how it's going to react, but I really just want to feel justified right now, and that son of a bitch is a motherfucker, and I'm going to make him get theirs, you know, and it's like ego wants to, like, tantrum off and shit. So it takes a while to, to get through that. You can't just snap your fingers and go from that into this more compassionate paradigm. It took me a few years. This is not something that you hit a button and one moment you're there and the other moment you're there. That would be like trying to jump the ship jumping over the, the landmass from the Atlantic to the Pacific instead of taking the Panama Canal. You can't do that. You're going to crash and burn if you can even get up off you know into the air at all. So you can't do that. And it, it is a bitch and it is a process and it can be agonizing and annoying but once you get there, it does actually work. Yeah, precisely. I mean, it's, you know, we're going through an awakening cycle. It's just, you know, it's going to be a very earth-shaking process, and we've got to realize that the politicians are playing the game, and as that video clearly stated, you know, Francis Hollande is funding the violent extremists who are attacking Frenchmen. And recently, the other day, what does France do? They bomb an ISIS fuel depot. Hmm, I wonder where that all that fuel for that fire came from. Gee, I don't know. Uh, the fact that he's allowing, you know, extremist Muslims into the country to create jihad against the French, and then the French are going to all of a sudden have this bad, narrow-minded view of the Muslims and say, we need to do to the Muslims as the Nazis did to the Jews. I mean, this is a repetitive circle, and it's just going to come back to bite the world in the ass so bad that most people won't know what to do with themselves. You know? It's just this proverbial circle of just pain and suffering, and Fortunately, there are a lot of people waking up to the reality that, you know, we're just walking around in this circle that's taking us to nowhere, and eventually we're going to wander our way out. You know, everything has to come to an end eventually, but um, it's going to be a rough process. And, you know, we've got to realize that there are people in this world who are just taking advantage of people's heightened emotional state and trying to use that to ensue and create conflict and use it to make lots and lots of incentive, a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of authority there. And there are some people who just can't turn that uh, that idea, that prospect down. You know, That's a pretty good deal. You know, Get people pitted against each other, fund both sides, make tons of money. And... Uh, not have any backlash effects as a result of that, you know. And that's really kind of just my bit and piece. I mean, <clears throat> wasn't very articulate with some of the stuff I said, you know. I'm just kind of trying to think off the top of my head, you know. But I mean, you pretty much summed it up perfectly <laughs> besides that. <laughs> that's, always, that's always the best way to do it, just off the top of your head. And 
the, the more you get comfortable with speaking off the top of your head, the more organized and articulate your thoughts become over time. It's just like anything else you practice. At first, you know, you're going to fumble a little bit, but the more you practice, if, if you don't get discouraged and you keep practicing it, then, you know, you just get better at what you practice at. So off the top of your head speaking is, is no different. Um, as a matter of fact, I compare it to what I've learned about about uh, gardening. It's a bit ironic. Um, when you focus on trying to eliminate every weed in your garden, you have more weeds than flowers. The weeds become a menace. But strangely enough, when you respect the weeds' right to be there, equal to that of the flowers, your entire perspective on how to garden shifts into a new paradigm, and the flowers dominate the weeds. I hardly have to weed my garden at all anymore because my flowers are just so pervasive and invasive and overwhelming <laughs> that, you know, there's a few weeds here and there, but it's like, who cares? The flowers are dominant, and they weren't able to dominate until I let go of my judgment of the weeds. I mean, it sounds crazy from, you know, a societal oh. perspective, but, it. I mean, I've got physical proof right here in front of me that it works, and, you know, someone on the Internet's going to be like, well, that's crap, and blah, that doesn't work, and you're stupid, and whatever. It's like, okay, well, Don't, that's, no. that's, that's fine, that's but I'm not going to take text on a screen as an authority of what I've seen with my own eyes, you know. <laughs> As the old saying goes, don't knock it until you try it. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's another thing people have a hard time arguing with me on. Like when I'm talking about experience and they're trying to tell me, oh, no, that's just a belief system you have. You haven't bought it stupid, blah, blah, and all this crap. I just I say something that they have a hard time disagreeing with. I say, look, I don't know you. You are text on a screen. I would be stupid to take text on a screen as an authority of my real life in person experience that I've seen with my own eyes. And I wouldn't expect, you know, you to do that either. I wouldn't expect you to take me as an authority over your own real life experiences. So with all due respect, sorry, I'm gonna go with my experience little line of text on a, on a screen from somebody I don't know, I, I can't see their face, I can't talk to them, it's just a line of text in a fucking document. Sorry, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have, I, I, I have my opinions, I mean, you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of, there, there are some things that I'm going to have to see a lot of proof on before, you know. I get sold on an idea, which that's kind of understandable in the, in the human condition. We all kind of look for that that kind of evidence that kind of goes, oh, this is pretty legitimate, you know, this this isn't just a crock of shit, you know, and that 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 kind of that takes time, you know, obviously, and you gotta have you gotta have a long experience with something before you can kind of look back in retrospect and go, you know. That is true. But, That's uh, what I love about things like uh, quantum physics and, and metaphysics, especially when they're presented correctly. They're not belief systems. It's more like, here's data. If you're interested, play with it and experiment with it and see what results you get. You know, So it's not like, here is the almighty data, and you must bow before it and not question it, otherwise you are committing blaspheme against the almighty. No. It's just like, all right, here's data. Play with it or not. If you play with it, have fun. If not, okay, fine, whatever. Whatever floats your boat. But that's cool. You can, you can play with it. You can mess with it. You can experiment with it. And when you're getting results, and you see that you're putting information into action and actually getting results. And it's like, oh, okay, I see that. And not, well, I'm going to believe it because I'm taking the word of this motherfucker over here who claims to be all high, mighty, ala, baba, bazoo, over whatever, and da, 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 da. So, you know, definitely we need that, that exper experience. We need to, instead of rejecting or accepting data, just seeing data as data and using critical thinking and going, hmm, 
what can I do with this? Well, they're saying you can do this, this, and this, and hmm, well, do I want to play with that? Yeah, maybe I'll play with that a little bit. You know, how do I want to play with these ideas? And, you know, kind of treat it like a kid with a with, um, Lego box, so to speak, just messing around, seeing what you could do or not. And that's how that sort of information should be explored because we do need to create our own experience with that. Anybody who just blindly accepts someone's words is a fucking idiot. Mm-hmm. That's why. That's why Jesus did miracles, or quote unquote, what we perceive of as miracles. Hell, a, a, a laptop would be a miracle to somebody back then. But you know, that's why Jesus demonstrated things, and he's like, "All right, here's what I did. You can do all sorts of cool shit too, as long as you're willing to experiment with that and play with that and go in the direction of that." and see what you can do. Mess with it a bit. Jesus wasn't like, yeah, look what I can do, motherfucker. Now you bow before me or I'm going to kick your ass. No, he didn't do that. Well, he wouldn't be very Christian if he did that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And it seems like a lot of um, modern-day, quote-unquote, fundamentalist, uh, goody-two-shoes, quote-unquote, you know, um, Christians, hint of sarcasm there, um, act that way. You know, it's like, oh, I, 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 I'm much better than I used to be, so, you know, and my experiences dominate everything else, so you're, you're so what I have to say, motherfucker, you're, you're a dumbass if you don't. You're never going to get anywhere if you don't. Yeah. It's kind of the point of Christians pooping on each other. Mm -hmm. I remember a few years back, whenever it was, um, the, the whatever heads of the Catholic Church, I don't know if it was the Pope or some bishop or whatever, but they said, Catholicism is the world's only one true religion. And even though like Lutherans are equally full of shit, I do like their comeback. They said, yeah, well, the Pope is the office of the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I mean, I think it's it's a dick wagon contest either way. But still, I do like the, I, I do think that the reply that the Lutherans gave was really witty. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, it it just it's you know. At this point, humanity is kind of still locked in that, you know, 5,000-year-old dick wagging contest of, you know, it's it's our way or the highway, and, you know, if you don't follow us, we're going to we're gonna make quick work of you, et cetera, so on and so forth, you know. <clears throat> if, you don't, if you don't forcefully change yourself to our demands, you're going to be, you know, destroyed, you know, well, people are starting to figure out that that doesn't work and really has never worked and when people finally come to a realization that that's the case um, it's the proverbial mind fuck it's like what so you mean everything I knew or everything as I know it isn't right empires rise, empires rise when they first put the diaper on and empires fall when the diapers to so fully loaded that gravity does the rest. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep, just like Rome or anything else. And unfortunately, the United States America, of America Mystery Babylon Corporation, as I've heard some call it, which is kind of hilarious in my honest opinion. I think it sounds kind of wacky-tacky, but... Well, you do know what what the um, Statue of Liberty actually is. Um, that's, that's the Babylonian goddess Semiramis. Interesting. And that torch that she's holding, that's the, um, basically, if you want to call it this, the Illuminati torch. And you'd have to look more into the history of what what the goddess Samiramis represents and the court the torch represents and all this and that. But put plainly, what the Statue of Liberty says is, you think you're free, but you're not. I'm showing you, but you don't see it. That's what the, that's the message that the Statue of Liberty is actually giving. 
you think you're free, but you're not. I'm telling you, but you don't see it. Because you don't know how to read the symbolism. I'm telling you, but you don't see it. Like trying to read hieroglyphics. Everything is symbolism. When you know what the symbols mean, you know what the message is. When you don't know what the symbols mean, you don't know what the message is. Kind of like I, I explained uh, when Katie was little, when she was like um, three or something like that, and she was able to associate. She she just she viewed words as just picture symbols, and she was able to associate those words with particular videos on YouTube. So even though she technically couldn't read, she was able to bookmark things and go back to it, and it was pretty interesting. But the point is, is that even with that, she had no way of uh, like reading yet at that point. She couldn't read the sentences for what they really were, so she assigned her own meanings. So that's what we're doing with the Statue of Liberty. Well, it's Lady Liberty, and she's all sovereign and tall and proud. She's a lady, and that's cool. You know, we got this awesome lady with this crown and crowns are like power and you got this light we're lighting the way for the world yeah yeah that's freedom man she represents freedom and you know the banksters are looking at the Americans shaking their head laughing and just chuckling like okay if that's what you want to think it is alright cool we're not going to tell you you're wrong <laughs> uh, yet again I mean if you reinvent a symbol it can the Statue of Liberty could easily represent freedom. I can't tell you how many Christian churches back in the ancient days of, you know, the empires of Greece and Rome took symbols that represented terrible things and, you know, brought them back to God, you know, and made them represent something truly noble and truly good. The Statue of Liberty can be taken in both both meanings. I mean, it doesn't have to represent... I agree, but my point is, is that the people who put the statue there in the first place and why, that's what I'm talking about. I was talking about the French that gave it to us on the centennial of our country's birth, but, you know. There's, and needless to say, there's a bit more backstory, and people who are interested can research that or not. If they're not interested, that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's up to the individual to look into these things or not as per what they feel is best for themselves. So I'm just putting it out there. People want to look more into it, cool. If not, that is equally just as fine. Mm-hmm. Do. Yep. I mean, it's just, you know. I don't really know what else to say. <laughs> well, it would have been great if one of the other people that I invited into the room could have actually made it, but so far, nope. This is probably one of the most uh, random paradigm shift hangout calls of the century, but whatever. <laughs> well, they're all, they're, well, most are usually spur of the moment. I mean, very, very few of these things are ever like totally like pre-planned. Like, yeah, two weeks from now on this date, we're gonna da da. No, I, no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying this has probably been one of the quietest, you know. Oh. Un, un kind of ununiversally coordinated, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was mentioning that, you know, kind of filling the space between the pause. That when you know, when we get get to these kind of awkward what the fuck moments, that it's usually because you know there's a bunch of people in the room and we were talking, and all of a sudden there's some sort of huge technical glitch that like boots everybody's ass off, and then everybody tries to get back in. Everyone's like, oh, what the fuck happened with that man, you know, and stuff like that. It's not like a situation where everything's working fine, but the participants just like dropped off the face of the earth. They're still technically logged in, but you know, I'm not saying anything, and I'm just here like, okay, well, let's see if I can get anybody else in on board. Hmm, you know, and posting a status on the freaking, um, on my Facebook page and giving people my URL. I'm like, all right, if you want the link to join in, you know, just like message me privately. <laughs> but no one was, uh, you know, the only people that were popping up were the ones that I had originally sent the invitation to. And they were like, oh, sorry, I'm like really busy right now. I'd love to, but, you know, it's the wrong time. And it's like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of just been a bit random, you know. Mess today, but oh well. Life tends to be that way sometimes. <laughs> well, I guess in the in in the process of trickling this down to a close, I guess I'll ask what what would you uh, recommend as far as you know, when people are looking at all the all these news articles and all this sensationalism and false flag shit with, you know, ISIS and all this other stuff, and how would you recommend that they process that information so that it's in a way that they can use their intelligence about it and not be acting like a rabid dog on crack cocaine? Use information wisely and discern everything you hear. Use logic, but also at the same time, use this. Don't use one or the other alone. Use an eagle, not a headphone set for discernment. I'm, I'm just trolling you, sorry. Yes, I know. Of course you are. <laughs> But think for yourself. Don't just go with what the media says. Don't go, you know, oh, those crazy militants today did this or that. Or bombed the New World Trade Center. Oh, and by media, we also yeah. mean the independent media, too. I mean, regardless of the source, don't just blindly believe headlines. Like, I read it, and I approve of the source, so I'm going to automatically accept it with no discernment at all. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, yeah, changing channels with your nose, essentially. Yeah, you, 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 you don't want to be one of those people. You just discern everything you hear. And oh, on the World Trade Center thing, if it does happen, which it probably won't, but you heard it here, and that was just off the top of my head, just, I don't know. They're crazy. Those globalists are crazy. You never know what they might do next. If they decide to pull a second, or I've lost count. They did the first one, 97? Yeah, so it would be like the third one. They are predictable, but yet again, they're not. I mean, you, it's it's proverbial catch twenty two. I've said proverbial more times today than than just anyway. Yeah. Thanks. And I also I think I'd like to remind people that even the people making the you know the news articles and stuff, regardless of how much research they've done, any human can still only uh, observe and process and express data through their own perspective and. Uh, even neurologically, like the way the brain is wired, it is a fact that we perceive reality. Five senses and whatever other beyond the five, and by beyond the five, I'm not getting mystical. I mean things like of comprehending concepts. That's obviously not a five sense thing. That's purely within the realm of the mind. Um, but, you know, all that stuff. You're processing that information based on who you are and your paradigm. So, you know, you're processing your five senses and your intellectualization, conceptualization, ideology, imagination, all that stuff. You're processing that based on, you know, your paradigms and who you are, what you've experienced, what you believe, and all the little cross-referencing associations and neural networks your brain has made through that little journey. So you are seeing the world more as you are, not as it is. So no no one really actually has any empirical evidence. There's technically no such thing. Humans simply observe that which they are observing, and they kind of question themselves about it, and they go, what is that? What does it appear to be? How does that appear to be happening? Um, they did that with the atom. Scientists observe patterns and interactions of energy, and they're like, wow, what could be causing that? Well, gee, the only thing that should, that could possibly be causing that is these solid billiard balls freaking banging around called atoms. And they got protons and neutrons and electrons and so on and so forth. 
But then as science evolved, we see that everything's made of energy. Those protons are made of energy. Neutrons are energy. Electrons are energy. And they're not sitting still. They're not, you know, they're not like circling in orbit or spiraling like the planets. They're moving so fast that they're in freaking superposition all over the fucking place. It's just this big electromagnetic field and fields within fields within fields. And empty space is just another type of energy. And then, gee, what is energy? It's light. And we're taught that light has no mass, which makes physical reality holographic. It's a holographic illusion. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No. It means we have a high level of ignorance in regards to what matter is. And uh, our information is insufficient. It's filled with lots of assumptions. So it's no different than, you know, these ancient primitive people that, you know, a storm comes in. And they judge that storm as, as negative. They don't like it. It's like, we don't like this big nasty storm. Why is that here? Oh, the gods must be pissed off at us. Well, you know, uh, maybe if we sacrifice a virgin, like the, the god will like calm down and the storm will go away. Because they didn't have any understanding of, of weather systems. So they thought like, you know, one of the gods is just getting pissed and open up a can of whoop ass and so on and so forth. Well, scientists made a similar fairy tale when they observe these interactions and wow, what's causing that? Well, there must be these things called atoms. So I'm not saying that atoms and electrons and neutrons and protons don't exist. I'm just saying that our understanding of their existence is almost completely fucked. And I think it, this is the point where you would probably add in something about your grandparents. Well, yeah. I mean, they spent 30 or 40, well, how many years? 35 years. I've lost, I've lost, they've lost count, I've lost count, it's been so long. They were doing it long before I was born, they were doing it since the 70s, so they, you know, and of course most people go, no way, he's crap full of shit, he's great. I want to specify what it is that they were doing, because if you just say they're doing it, it's not going to be sex, man, you know. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can explain that. Well, they went to Africa back in, what was it, 76, centennial year, 75, 76, my dad was 13, 14 years old, they went to Kenya, um, went out to the Rift Valley, a place that had hardly ever been explored, I mean, if you do a Google search on the Rift Valley, you would realize why, Did because... Did they run into Obama while they were there? <laughs> no, he was in the southern portion of Kenya, and he was in Malaysia at the time, so no, they did not run into Obama, and they wouldn't know who he was, he would have just looked like another idiot in Africa, which there are plenty of those on the continent, believe me. But anyway, they went out to the Rift Valley, and came across a group of people known as the Pokot, and yes, you can research those people, they do in fact exist. There's limited information on the internet of where they of them as a people, but you can find things, artifacts, you know, like warrior stools that carve these, these, you know, wood stools that you know the warriors would sit on. There are pictures of them on the internet. But anyway, they're basically Kalenjin, which is the race, the particular race of African, and these people have been living out there for, you know. 5,000 years, as long as Babylon and any of that stuff had been going on, they were there. You know, that was their native ancestry, their home spawning grounds out in the middle of a desolate, godforsaken desert. I mean, you, you, you go out into the Rift Valley, you'd swear you had walked to the end of the earth and were looking over the proverbial cliff. I just said proverbial again, but you're looking over the cliff, you know. But, you know, it's this giant, giant valley out in the middle of East Africa. And my grandparents were Christian missionaries. So they went out there, and they've given 35 years. And they, they've seen the quote-unquote spiritual battlefield, or mean whatever the hell you want to call it, whatever you believe. I believe in the spiritual battlefield, good and evil, Satan, the whole nine yards. Some people, you know, Dave doesn't believe in that. That's fine. You know, he's entitled to his views like I am. I've, my experience kind of tends to make me think different. But... You know, they, they were out there for 35 years. They've finally, since 
retired not too long ago from doing that, and they passed it on to another group of people um, in Montana. And, you know, they're, they're out in the spiritual unknown. They're out there dealing with people who believed in witch doctors and gods and, you know, all of these different, you know, spiritual powers. Hey, dude, we lost you. We're not hearing you. Are you there? You were speaking, but um, your your audio is gone. Can you hear me? Ah, no, I can. Yes. You were you were I think talking about how similarly to how the scientists came up with you know the atom these um these uh, primitive views were like, you know, if uh, if somebody got sick, it must be the anger of the gods. They didn't understand, mm -hmm. you know, viruses or, you know, things like things like that. It's just like, you know, oh, you know, we must appease the gods and then they will make this person feel better. And if we fail at appeasing the gods, this person might die. And then they're trying to figure out exactly what it is they did to offend the gods and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that sort of deal. Yeah, my grandmother would tell me of all sorts of stories, and my grandparents have told me hundreds of stories of different accounts, but on their first trips out there, they would they would pack up much like you would for a camping trip in Oregon, you know, go out in the forest, have your tents, your firewood, all, your, all the stuff you'd need, you know, Bottles of Coca Cola, you know, all all your food, your you know, snacks, candy, every everything you're gonna need out there to be comfortable for yourself. But what they quickly realized is these people were so. At first, they were afraid. The women weren't afraid. The kids weren't afraid. But the main men were afraid because they thought they were the military going out there to kick some ass and take some stuff. But then they realize that these people are different, and the, the, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put it into context for you. They were so foreign to the Pocot, they'd never seen a white person before. So you can imagine how well that went. And my dad, at the time, this this was probably about when he was 16, 15, and he was starting to grow a beard. The little kids would walk up and they would pick the hair. Around his chin because they had never seen a kid at the age of 16 with facial hair. This, this is how foreign Europeans and you know the Western culture was to them. They they had no clue. The cows would sit there. The cows would sit there and stare at them because they were white. You know, they they saw they saw this this, this world to him to them never existed. You know, these people would walk around emaciated during famine season. That reminds me of Avatar with, with, with Jake Sully and at first the tribe was against them and it's like like oh well oh, wait a minute. We've never had a, a a one of the sky people come who was a warrior. They've always been scientists. This is the first warrior. We gotta stop and rethink this. This is the first time this has happened. So um, your grandparents were, were kind of like that. Like, well, wait a minute. This is a different type than we're used to. Let's not be hasty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, I mean, it's kind of hard to go into detail. It's kind of my off day, and I'm just kind of, you know, my mind's just kind of in this, you know, I'm Your audio just went to hell again. You might want to fix that. Your audio just completely went to crap again. Please hold while General Tate fixes his audio. Your Google Hangout is important to us. Please can hold. you hear me? Now I can. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Yes, okay. now I can. Yes, okay. no. Okay, good. Yeah, it's the USB port. It's, but I'm trying to keep it. It 
sometimes it just sucks. But anyway, as I was saying, mine's kind of fuzzy today. I've been working for the last three days, so I'm just kind of like, my mind's kind of in rest mode, but at the same time, I've got part of my grandparents, or one, my grandmother's book that she's been writing. It didn't succeed with the publishing or whatever, but she's written, written quite a bit. And, you know, it started 40 years ago, and as I was going to say, they would go out there with all of their camping supplies. You know, they'd have these basic med kits, and they'd never seen people in a state of famine in, you know, I mean, we see in the West all we think of when we think of people being hungry. We think of a homeless guy sitting on a bench in a park somewhere, you know, who hasn't eaten in a couple of days. Well, these people haven't eaten in months. You know, these people are like rails. They look like they walked out of Auschwitz, and there's hundreds of them. And eventually, once they realize that my grandparents were, in fact, there to help and not cause problems, that people would come out of everywhere. People would walk miles just to to see them, you know, because they knew that they were they were civilization. They knew they knew that they were something different. They weren't, you know, they weren't the status quo. They weren't the norm. And you know, they'd have all these basic medications like you know Neosporin and you know all of these different you know antibiotic ointments and stuff stuff that you pick up at the yeah. Pharmacy at the pharmacy counter that we don't yeah, even know. Yeah, they didn't really understand the idea of technology or how it all works, but they, they did realize that the ones they that knew. were, and yeah, they were they in the knew. military get-ups, huh? Well, the, the, people, the, the people knew on a basic level that they weren't there to cause problems. They were there to help. And, well, no, no know, I mean the original people, the first white people that they saw that were military. No, these, that, were, these were fellow Africans. These oh, were they were? Yeah, Kenyans. These were Kenyan soldiers. These were African oh, Kenyan soldiers. Oh, so these weren't, these weren't like British or UN? No. Or... Well, the British went in there about 75 years before, and the Pocot didn't want anything to do with the British. They told the, the Pocot means, in their language, Deadwood. Okay, mm -hmm. these, pe these people didn't want anything to do with them. They didn't want anything to do with the British. They said, leave us the hell alone. Go away. You know, they told they told the you know the British asked you know when they were surveying the country, well, who are you people? And they replied, we're the Pocot, we're Deadwood. So we they were used to, they were used to Africans with higher technology coming in and trying to stir up trouble, and yes. they might not have understood the technology, but they knew that these people were trouble and they didn't want anything to deal with them. Then these white people come in, they're like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, most of them, not, like I said, that's why they, they walked up to my, you know, to my grandparents and my dad, and they would, you know, pick the hairs on their arms because they'd never seen somebody that had, you know, hair all over their body. That was like a foreign concept, you know, a 16-year-old with a beard. My dad had the nickname around their young Mize, and Mize is, you know, their language for old man. He was the young old man because he had, only the old men grew beards, you know. But anyway, they would go out there with their basic antibiotic ointments and their, you know, stuff that they had in their little med kits. And, you know, the people realized what those first aid kits, I mean, they weren't, they were primitive, but at the same time they knew. They knew what stuff was. They didn't, they weren't stupid to the facts. They, they got the idea that, you know, these people can help us. And then before you know it, my mother empties all of her, or my, my grandmother empties all of her tubes of, you know, antibiotic ointments curing all these little tiny infections and, you know, cuts and all of this stuff that could easily be treated here in the first world, but there, you know, it's a life or death thing if, you know, you're malnutrition, you know, there's no real way you can, you can take care of that, but here, you know, we just take multivitamins every day and we don't have to worry about, you know, lacking key vitamins to, you know, keep eye health and all that stuff over there, they don't have that option, you know. Well, these days you got to know the, uh, uh, these days you got to know the difference between the Agenda 21 vitamins and the real ones, but, you know, beyond that, yeah, I get your point. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it was, 
and, and the stuff helped because they, you know, and at first it was just small select groups of people. They'd see people on the side of the road. They'd come out and they'd help them. They'd do their thing, you know, they'd treat them. And then these people would realize that these people had all the stuff, you know, these first aid kits and all this cool stuff, you know, that they can use to help. And then that's when the hundreds of emaciated people and, you know, sickly people and old people and children and <laughs> people come out of everywhere, you know, the second or third time they come out there, there's a lot of people out there waiting to see them, you know, because they realize, hey, these people have got it, you know, these people can help us, you know, and, and it was really interesting once they got a clinic set up out there, and this was probably, you know, seven or eight years later, they set up a little clinic in a town called Kiwawa, which is towards the more western part of the country, up there in the high the high desert, you know, they'd say, they set their clinics up, and uh, these people were still locked in the, the rituals of tribalism. This was kind of the main point I was going for, but these people would, you know, come in sick and ill, and, you know, they'd, they'd have all the medicines and all the things that they can use to treat, you know, their condition, but these people would, were still locked in that animistic nature. They would have a witch doctor come in and do their, their herbal ritual and, you know, try to appease the gods, but at the same time, then they take the pill after they did their ritual to get better. So, you know, there was, there, there was a lot of years there where they they were changing from the paradigm of living in that, that world of ignorance and fear, you know, of the gods must be angry at us, and to, you know, God died on the cross, you know, Jesus died on the cross for us, and God came to redeem humanity. And the, and the mentality there has changed. The people are flourishing, they're happy, they're bouncing up, the, you know, they, they dance, they, they have these long church choir sessions for hours and hours and hours and hours on end. You know, churches will congregate from every which way to celebrate at Christmas. And, you know, it the mentality there, just, just the message of God, you know, has completely changed that world of darkness and has completely flipped the chaos and brought order and understanding. I guess when they, when, they still did, when they still did the rituals, even though they were taking, you know, the antibiotics and stuff, I guess th th their their view of it was, was kind of like, okay, well, the God sent these people to us, so we must have done something right, so let's keep on the God's good side. We, we know it's the medications that's going to heal us and not the rituals, but it's these gods that sent us these medications, so we still got to do the ritual. Otherwise, exactly. maybe God might make these people go away. Maybe exactly. the gods might take these people away from us, and then we won't have these medications anymore. So exactly. that was kind of their attitude, still like in that fear mode. Better safe than sorry, yeah. But uh, yeah, they, and and now they know they know the truth. They've got pastors, you know. They've got African pastors there. They're teaching Africans and going out and baptizing and doing all of the things that you know Jesus said to do, you know. And they're going up into even more remote, uncharted places, and it's spreading and it's growing and it's getting bigger. But you know, the mentality in Eastern Africa has completely changed, and the region is now recognized recognized as civilization and the Western world is now spreading into, you know. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's, not, and it's not a fundamentalist Christianity over there. It's not like, do as I say, you're going to burn in hell, motherfucker. It's, it's, it's you know, more like that, that loving sort of appreciation and thankfulness that was, you know, the original intention. It's not like, you know, these, you know, crazy... You know, Bible thumping like if you comb your hair the wrong way, you're gonna burn in hell. Oh my God, I went to freaking parochial Christian school, and you know, if anybody wants to send their kids to the next best thing to a Nazi concentration camp, parochial Christian school is where it's at. I'm telling you, that's Hitler without the Hitler, man. That's whoo. <laughs> Wow. Do as I say, or you're going to hell, and you're going to burn in the fire and the brimstone, and all oh God, that reminds me of my fifth grade, um, my fifth grade teacher, Miss Miss Hitsky, right? My God, she's a freaking wacko. Um, 
I, you know, I had been I had been raised um, that like, all right, you know, when you die, you're gonna go to heaven and be with God, and um, you know, that's what I believed at the time. And Miss Hitsky was telling me something completely different. She's like, no, when you die, you're dead, and then when Judgment Day comes, you're resurrected and then judged. And I said, well, I wasn't taught that. I was taught, you know, believe in God, believe in Jesus. You die and you go to heaven to be with him. She's like, if you believe that, then you're going to hell. And I was like, what? I told my mom about that at the time, and she was none too happy with um, Miss Hitsky's attitude. She was a freaking psycho. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> Just one of many examples. Oh, oh, I gotta, as long as I'm on a hangout anyway, I don't think I've ever explained this one on any sort of recorded hangout thing. Um, this is hilarious. This is just a great example of just how sick and twisted um, Christian parochial schools can get. Seventh and eighth grade, the church pastor, um, he was our, our, you know, seventh and eighth grade uh, religion teacher, right? And he was up there preaching and telling us all about how much God loves us, you know. God loves you, God loves me, lovey dovey dovey dove. God loves you so much that when you die and go to heaven, he loves you just so much, he's going to have sex with each and every one of you. And we're all like, what? And I raised my hand, and he's like, yeah. I'm like, um... I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, so you're telling us that when we die, go to heaven, that God is going to literally have sexual intercourse with all of us. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, like, all our faces damn near turned green. I mean, I don't think there was a person in the classroom who actually <laughs> believed that line of shit. But we were definitely wondering what sort of bad drugs he was taking that day. Yeah. That guy was, freak that guy was freak creepy, nasty. And this uh, wasn't a Catholic, yeah. uh, this wasn't a Catholic, you know, altar boy blowjob sort of situation. I went to Lutheran Missouri Synod School, you know, it wasn't Catholic, but man, this guy was creepy. Yeah, you want to talk about one of the main problems in the church, it's fornication and adultery and all that other good stuff. That's one of the, that's one of the big issues. Yeah, I got a, a little, you know, a section of video me and Katarina took during one of the times she was here, and we were kind of talking about that, and she was kind of talking about whole, like, the the false sense of spirituality, and people get all high and mighty, and like, I am transcendent of the flesh. I do not need sex. Come here, little boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, the way she did it was so funny. You'd have to watch the clip, but just like, like the way she was giving that rant look on her face and everything, it's like it busted out laughing. <laughs> oh, God. That was great. Uh, I think that was one of the many clips I used in the, oh god, it was the Overcoming Fear of Self-Promotion series, and that one's a four-parter, and we did that because that was like total, like, on-camera recorded practical application of, like, facing and moving through and overcoming paradigms, so it's like, Instead of us just talking all about these ideologies, um, people were actually able to see our, our processes firsthand, um, and that kind of make you know makes it more relatable to the viewer, so they can actually see us going through stuff instead of like, oh well, they're just talking about this ideological thing, which is airy fairy up on some cloud somewhere and being asked to believe it, and blah blah blah. It's like no, we're just like showing them firsthand all this shit. And it's like it makes things definitely more relatable. 
Mm-hmm. It's just about that dichotomy of like, oh, you're not allowed to be yourself and express yourself as you. You got to conform, and you know that whole indoctrination and self abuse and this like the process of facing that shit and overcoming it, knowing that doesn't make you some arrogant, bragging fucking son of a bitch to just be yourself. Because, like, you know, when you when you accomplish something and you want to make yourself an example to everybody else, it's like, hey, you know, you can do this too. I'm a normal person just like you are. And, you know, you can do the same thing and you're trying to be an empowering an example and uplift people. And then there's some people who are going to be like, oh, well, you're just a bragging, arrogant, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of like um, um, what happened to uh, to me in um in, in a Facebook group the other day. It was kind of kind of me and Katarina were ha simultaneously having this experience, but like after all was said and done, it was primarily directed at, at me, like in regards partially to Katarina. And I'm gonna tell this story, but I'm just gonna state in advance that. I'm not trying to bash the group or bash anyone in the group. I'm not, like, criminalizing anybody. Um, I'm respecting that, you know, everybody's looking at these situations through the filters of their own paradigm. So I don't really take it as them being like, oh, yeah, I'm being a jerk, and I know I'm being a jerk. <laughs> I'm going to fuck with Dave, man. <laughs> no, it's, like, it's not like that, like... I don't think there was any, like, real intention of anyone being a dick. It was just more like a paradigm clash. Um, the group is called is called Cosmic Voice. Um, it's a Facebook group. Uh, Katarina ended up on their little uh, radio thing there, um, Cosmic Voice Radio. Uh, they got a lot, of, a lot of good information on there, and the radio show's cool, and the people there are generally nice, and so on and so forth. But one of the problems that we ran into is um, there's a... A common paradigm that, like, if you're trying to share information and get the word out, and you're doing it as you through, you know, your own resources and capability, that all of a sudden people are going to start screaming, Oh my God, service to self, service to self, get out of here, you're not trying to help humanity, and, like, all these assumptions and shit, like, start getting made, like, I was being being told things like, you know, well, you're, you know, you're promoting these various things for your your YouTube channel, and you and Katarina are doing this, so, like, it's just you and Katarina advertising yourselves through Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy, and, like, you know, they admitted that they're so busy, they haven't really had much time to research me or research my channel or research anything of what we're doing, and... Anybody who searches through my channel, it's a, it's almost like a variable free version of Blockbuster Video or something like that. There are so so many different people and so much information that we that we put out that you know if you try to go through it too fast, it it'll almost make you dizzy because there's so much to choose from. Not only the different people and topics and stuff that we spotlight in the Paradigm Shift episodes. And, you know, we interview in the chats and, you know, stuff like this. Not only all the fair use clips and things that we use to, to show people, you know, hey, these other people exist and they're doing all this cool shit. You might want to check them out. Not only that, but just the 2,000 plus playlists. When you go into the playlist section and there's all this different content, everything you could think from, it's, it's almost dizzying if you browse through it too fast. There's all this stuff. So with all that diversity and all the sharing of knowledge from all these different sources, it's not like I'm up there with Katarina going, me, 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 us, 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 fuck everybody else. You know, I'm doing my best to put out as much information from as, as many people as possible. There's, you know, everybody's got, you know, their life purpose and doing the best that they can do and all these different expressions and things that people are doing are valid and not ev not everybody's way of doing things is going to mesh with everybody's brain. We're not clone troopers, different strokes for different folks, so as many different expressions of this data as can be made available, if, you know, something doesn't, you know, mesh with one person's brain, 
then, you know, maybe uh, some of the other stuff will. So it's like, you know, I'm here like as, um, as an information service, not as an internet Nazi, not as, as the fucking web police, you know, and that's the capacity I'm, uh, you know, I'm working in just putting all this information out. So, you know, here these people are in this group like, well, you know, you're, you're blah, 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 service of self, this and that. And I mean, I, I can understand their paradigm. They're not trying to be dicks. They're, they're locked in this paradigm of, you know, if you're accomplishing anything or you're saying anything that, that automatically makes you service to self, arrogant, bragging, whatever, this, that, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the whole, like, um, elementary school sort of attitude. Everybody encourages you to excel and do your best. And as soon as you excel and do your best and you go, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. And then, you know, it's like, you're not allowed to talk about that. You're being rude and bragging and self-serving and shame on you. And you're like, what? Everybody who's encouraging me to do my best when I finally do it, they're putting me down for it? What the fuck? You know, it's a common societal paradigm. People that are trapped in it don't know that they're trapped in it. They're not sitting there like pinky in the brain going, I know better and I'm just going to go and fuck with this person. <laughs> they're not like that. That's not, you know, it's not what they're doing. So I, you know, I totally understand. I don't, you know, fault anybody for anything. They're operating in their paradigm. I'm operating in mine. And, you know, the best I can do is just respect that. So I, I left that group because that was the only solution that I could say. You know, I, I'm still, you know, got the follow button clicked on it, you know. I'm still going to listen to the radio show when I have time and so on and so forth. It's just that I think it's going to be less trouble for everything, everybody for me to not enter in that minefield. Because they make it really, in my, my view, they make it really unclear as to what is acceptable to post and what's not. Because the second I start thinking something's acceptable and they're telling me, yeah, that's fine, you can do that, then I do that and they're like, oh, oh, you know, that's against our rights. Like, wait, what? You know, so it's their, their policies and procedures are not clear. And when I, when I posted, you know, the thing on my Facebook page about it, just like letting people know who have added me as a friend from that group, like, hey, you know, this is why I'm not going to be you know, you're not going to be seeing me in that group, so, you know, just in case you're wondering what hole I fell into or whatever. I explained the situation, and a lot of people actually replied, like, yeah, I was in that group, but I left too because, you know, they're treating everybody like kindergartners and, you know, going to people like, oh, don't do this, don't say that. Well, in the meantime, the group is all about freedom. Like, yeah, you know, be the change, get up off the couch, do what no one's willing to do. And then, you know, every time people are, are they start becoming willing to do that, then they get, like, pushed out. And it, and it shocks people. It's like, wait a minute, you're saying we, we should get up, get up off the couch and do this and be brave enough to do that, no, whatever. No, 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 no. And then as soon as we do it, we're getting told naughty naughty. You want me to? There's a lot of cognitive dissonance. Is it in the two flat switch machine? I think uh, some kind of and then we'll start another one once those are done. Continue. You're back, right? Yes. Okay, so my overall point that I just expressed as an example to, to your example point about, you know, the tribal people and so on and so forth is that everybody's got their paradigm and that most people aren't trying to be nasty. Everybody is doing the best that they can do with the tools that they have. So when we look at these situations like, you know, what's going on with ISIS and, you know, all this other crap, you know, don't look at these headlines and, you know, condemn it just because it's from Fox or whatever. Oh, it's mainstream. I shouldn't listen to that. And don't praise it because, oh, yeah, it's from Alex Jones or RT or blah, blah, blah. You know, just treat all information as information. Look at it with critical thinking and discernment and go, hmm, you know, um, 
these are all puzzle pieces here. What is what is this adding up to? And, and think with your own mind and use a bit of you know compassion and common sense and discernment and critical thinking and you know see the bigger picture that that most people you know really don't want to look at usually. So that's mm -hmm. you know kind of. My you got anything else to, to add to the paradigms of this? Any suggestions for, for people as to how to more easily process this information or what? Like I said, just think with an open mind and use plenty of discernment. That's all I can really say at this point if you're not there yet. The only time yeah. you can really have open, mind, open mind, not open ass. We don't mean be gullible. <laughs> we just mean, you know, put everything out on the table and think and you know, just like, uh, hmm, what is this? Instead of like, oh, this news headline said that this is this, so this must be it. Think, examine, observe. Believe nothing. More, inf believe more nothing. emphasis on, dis on observe. Yeah. Observation doesn't require anything but just an open mind and looking at all exactly. of the data. When you observe the tree, you don't have to believe the tree. You don't have to disbelieve the tree. It's it's not about that. <laughs> anyway, that's all I can really add to that. So. Okay. Well, I think we've really said all we can say on this for now. I don't think anybody else will be joining us. So, um... My thanks to everybody for, um, you know, watching this, whether they're watching it now or they're watching it, you know, at some point in the future. And I'm going to stop the broadcast. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, you and I can remain in this Hangout and it'll just be a, like a non-broadcasted Hangout when I hit stop broadcast. Or maybe it might close up and then at that point we'll switch to Skype, whatever. Um, but anyway... I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this to a close now. Um, thank you everybody for for listening and you know whatever whatever you want to believe about the situation, your thoughts, feelings, whatever you know, um, it's it's all good. You have the right to um, you know your views on things and to uh, do what you think is best for yourself. So you know I totally support that, respect that. You don't have to like me. You don't have to agree with me, believe me, nothing. You know you could think I'm just a stupid son of a bitch and that's still cool with me because I believe in freedom. So I'm not gonna be here like, oh you can't do that. So thanks everybody. Have a good day, morning, night, whatever it is for you over wherever you are at any time and uh, peace out.